Şimdi bundan sonraki konuşmacıyı kısaca tanıtmak zor ama e, elimden geleni yapayım. E, Usama Fayyad, e, iki sene önceden belki hatırlarsınız. Kendisi gerçek manada bir rocket scientist. Hani öyle derler ya, e, NASA'da 20'nin üzerinde patenti var, devlet e, madalyası almış. E, aynı zamanda dünyanın e, chief data officer e, ünvanına sahip ilk insanı. Böyle bir özelliği var. Hani şu anda çok daha fazla bunu şey yapıyoruz, görüyoruz ama bir de işte bu Yahoo da yapmış bir de bunu. Böyle herhangi bir şirketten de bahsetmiyoruz. Kurduğu şirketi Yahoo'ya sattıktan sonra ve o zamandan beri de teknoloji dünyasında işte en önüne gelen insanlarından bir tanesi. Çok şanslıyız burada olduğu için tekrar teşekkür ediyoruz. Bir de şöyle minik bir tebrik usamaya buradan. Bir iki hafta önce çok taze haber. Kurucularından olduğu Uda Health isimli startup ilk roundda 40 milyon dolar fon toplamış. Dolayısıyla herhalde şimdi bayağı bir cephaneleri var bu startup'ı da geliştirmek için. Ben lafı daha uzatmadan sahneye Usama Fayyad'ı davet etmek istiyorum. Usama, please. Thank you, as always. Okay. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Hamid, for a nice introduction. It's good to be back here in, in Istanbul. Um, today I will, I will be talking about um, cybersecurity, and I have uh, borrowed some slides from my friend and colleague, uh, Trolls Erting, who was the chief security officer at Barclays, and before that, uh, he ran the Interpol, uh, sorry, Europol, um, so he's a, a, a real security guy, both cyber and, uh, and real world. Uh, and we, we had given uh, some, some material in some talks before, so I, I borrowed some of his slides. Uh, Trolls is now at the World Economic Forum, uh, where they have started a global uh, center for cybersecurity. And they are trying to basically bring together uh, a lot of forces um, around the world to figure out a way to combat the growing threats. So what I'll be talking about is how bad uh, these threats are becoming and why we should worry. So part of this talk hopefully will make you very scared, and part of the talk uh, will give you some hope, because uh, through some technologies like AI and machine learning, uh, I think we can come up with good solutions to a lot of these scary problems. I'm not going to go through the definitions, right? These are standard definitions of cybersecurity versus information security, right? Cybersecurity is about the physical protection of systems, and information security is the actual uh, data, basically. How do you protect it, both from a privacy as well as a, a hacking perspective? Um, in business, this is a big cost. This is an average per, per business of a, of a certain size about $11.7 .7 million a year, uh, 130 security breaches per year per company, right? Per company. Uh, and the 11.7 .7 is per company, by the way. Uh, every minute, uh, about a million dollars is lost to cybercrime. Uh, the total cost is pretty scary, $600 billion. Uh, and we can you know, break it down by minute and by second, etc. Ransomware, which is when somebody, you know, breaches your systems and then holds the data hostage or the systems hostage and say, if you want to use your systems again, you have to pay me, uh, is $8 billion per year and growing dramatically. So it, it's a pretty, it's a pretty ba bad, uh, bad environment. There are three pillars of cybersecurity, and we're going to talk some more about these. Um, the first one is actual security itself. The second one is privacy, or understanding whether you can trust the data you see. And the third one is integrity. Um, security. I wanted to share this with you this graph. Uh, this is the world in data breaches. So um, if, you saw, if you see, of course, the North America is the highest target, right? Uh, the United States has the most breaches in the world. Uh, remember now, this is also a function of an ability to detect these. These are not just, 
you know, there may be a lot more elsewhere in the world. By the way, it's, it's uh, notable that actually Turkey is, is highlighted here. So uh, Turkey is, is one of the top areas. Uh, but the, the biggest ones are North America. And as you see, a lot of breaches are happening all the time. This is not, uh, this is almost the norm. It's, it's no longer so, sort of the exception. Integrity is when you see something, can you believe it? Uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw these videos, and if you haven't, you can go to YouTube. Uh, this is a group that actually utilized artificial intelligence, uh, took video screens of, uh, or video shoots of uh, President Obama, and then made him say whatever they wanted to say. And because they were able to manipulate the video with the, with the new audio they created, you could make the lips move correctly. So you can't actually tell the difference between is this the real person or not. Uh, so that is actually becoming also uh, another uh, scary technique that's happening. The third is privacy. And privacy uh, should affect all of you. So this the little device that you carry, this mobile, uh, it has a lot about you. What you write, your location, what you read, your contacts, who you write to, your plans, what you like, and what you search. And what happens? is if this is, uh, if somebody has access to this, they basically have access to you, and your family, and your friends, and your networks. Uh, you might think that, well, a lot of you heard about the Facebook uh, scandal, right? Uh, last April, 87 million members were notified that the platform, their data had been shared. Uh, June 27, it got worse. Right? Uh, this is with this whole uh, second wave. And then I don't know if you looked at the news. October 1st, right? It's the biggest hack. It's called the biggest hack in history, where they were able to expose the details of 50 million user accounts on Facebook, including the actual personal account of uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, and his COO, Sheryl Sandberg. What this allowed them to do is basically log into anything that you use Facebook to log into. So you can imagine uh, what, 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 what can be done here uh, w when you are breached. So how do we fight the threats? You know, you ask, OK, all these threats are there. How do we fight them? And this is where the news gets worse. Uh, you probably know about patching, right? Every once in a while, you have to patch your systems. You know, Microsoft releases a patch. Oracle releases a patch. And you have to keep your patches going. Everybody here heard of zero-day attack? Do you know the term zero-day? Yeah, zero-day is, is a joke, in my opinion. Uh, here's what it means. Zero-day, it means we just discovered a vulnerability. We just discovered a problem. We did a study. This is with a company I work with. I'm on their advisory board called Versec. And we basically looked at Carnegie Mellon University, and we looked at how long a vulnerability sits in your systems, in your network, before it's discovered, before it's called zero day, and then how long uh, until you patch it. And the bad news is uh, basically up to 80 weeks before, 80 weeks, right? So that's, that's basically a year and a half. It's sitting there. Nobody knows about it. Then it's discovered usually. And then after it's discovered, uh, it takes about 10 weeks to 15 weeks to get a patch. And here is the really bad news. It takes almost up to 40 weeks to get a patch deployed. So think about this. From minus 80 to plus 40 is about 120 weeks of exposure of something that already was there. We just didn't know about it before, and we discovered it. We call it zero day. But you can imagine how many vulnerabilities are sitting there today. In fact, the most recent Facebook one is an example of such a, a vulnerability. These go all the way from what we call script kiddies. These are people who just basically hack to brag about it, or they do simple stuff with simple scripts, uh, or the real bad, bad stuff, which comes usually from nation states uh, that have sophisticated uh, uh, groups and dedicated research budgets to do the hacks. And unfortunately, the hacks, the, the, these uh, uh, vulnerabilities that are basically developed by the nation states leak and they become available for criminals. And we'll talk about that for a second. So 
Uh, there's a, from some very famous ones. Stux virus is one of them, which was developed by the NSA to attack Iran nuclear plants. Suddenly, it started getting used everywhere for the WannaCry and other things. Patching is reactive, so you do it after the fact. The question now is, how do you detect? Can we actually detect uh, in, in real time or see what's happening instead of react after we know that there's a problem? Typically, detection happens by looking for files. You know, these, these uh, uh, vulnerabilities, if, if your machine is infected, there's probably a file somewhere or in a library or something is modified, and we look for that. However, the news here is getting much worse. We are now getting new classes of attacks. They're called fileless in memory, meaning they don't leave any trace on the file system, and they are in memory hacks, right? So extremely difficult uh, to detect. And in fact, if you look at the trend, uh, the trend is pretty scary. This is over time. We go, you know, Stuxnet, net, Stuxnet is the one on the left, which was developed by the NSA, the National Security Agency of the United States, and then leaked to the criminals. Uh, and then it actually progressed. And as you see, as we progressed, we started getting, number one, a lot more types of problems. And worse, they all are becoming fileless, meaning we don't have any means of detecting them. So they, they can just do their work, and you don't even see a trace of, of, of these things working. Uh, also, the, the, the changing types of vulnerabilities. Uh, it's very interesting here, because uh, you know, some of you may be familiar with SQL injection, SQL injection. Uh, that means you, know, you, you run a system, and it's expecting a query, and you, you write, it asks for your name, but you write your name in such a way where you embed a command inside your name, and it fools the system. The system thinks this is a command and executes it. Uh, this is fairly common in a lot of these uh, input uh, validation issues. These things sort of came down for a while and then came up. But the worst ones are the ones on the far right on the top, what we call buffer errors. These are basically examples of these uh, in-memory attacks, where they cause your code to have a problem, overflow the buffer, and the, the execution goes somewhere else. And therefore, the code starts doing something completely different, uh, and you don't know it. It's, you, may be running, you think you're running Word, but you're really running something else if, if it's infected. Here's the problem, is these things get weaponized at runtime. What do we mean by that? Well, there's some known good stuff, right? We know that user A is a good user, and it's, he's allowed or she's allowed to go into the corporate network and do things, send email, whatever. Uh, we also know the bad guys, right? We have them on a blacklist, and we block against them. The big problem is the unknowns, and that's the majority of the space. And the number of unknowns is much, much larger than the number of the knowns. So basically, uh, these guys are getting much more sophisticated. They look like normal traffic. When they get in, they can attack interpreted code, which is the inputs, the input validation, like SQL injection, compiled code, where they hack the actual application, or microcode, where they actually hack the systems. We may not have time to show you examples of the uh, critical infrastructure, but I wanted to take a couple of minutes, or five minutes, and talk a little bit about AI and big data and, and how all of this connects and the role to help us sort of counter these threats that are becoming unmanageable in cybersecurity. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about AI sort of hype versus reality. And we heard uh, uh, some mention uh, this morning of, of AI and, and some of the threats coming from it. Uh, it is also getting a lot of hype and a lot of attention. Uh, AI is simply defined as the use of computers to simulate human intelligence. And the problem we have is the term intelligence is not well defined. People have been trying to define it for actually hundreds of years. Uh, most famous is Alan Turing, who tried to do that in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, you know, we, we saw programs playing uh, people, and, and they seemed to be beating uh, world champions and playing Jeopardy, Watson, IBM, etc. Um, AI went through two waves of hype before. This is the third one. The first one was 1950s to 70s, when the, uh, when the phrase was actually created in a workshop in 1950, 54, I think. Um, and in 1970, there was a big disappointment. We call it the first AI winter, where 
A lot of work in AI just stopped. People gave up on it. And what happened there is people discovered that it's very hard to make computers do something that humans do very easily, which is we call it common sense reasoning. So you, you, I give you a statement, and you think about it, and you say, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. Turns out that that's very important for general intelligence, and it's very hard to do. Natural language understanding proved to be uh, very hard. And people tried to use mathematical logic to represent the world, and that didn't scale very well with computers. But there were some things that worked, right? So we got expert systems that worked. We got game players that worked very well. Uh, and they showed that you can actually do stuff that people thought machines could not do before. But none of the stuff that we do in, in terms of general intelligence. Then there was the second generation, which started in the 80s, when neural networks became popular the first time. And then people suddenly figured out, oh, neural networks, that's just statistical regression, nonlinear regression. It's nothing magical. But the second wave still failed. So that went on from the 80s until the early 90s. And then we had another winter where people stopped working about AI, decided most of the stuff doesn't work. Um, and what did we learn from that second wave? Well, we learned that the problem was worse. The problem is, it seems like in order to solve a problem, you need to know everything about the world somehow to solve it. Uh, and it seemed like we needed to understand what spatial reasoning was about, because it was about sort of problem solving through spatial reasoning. And these two, we didn't know how to do. Um, so lesson one for pragmatic AI, I'm going to share with you five lessons, is reduce the problem domain to one where complete knowledge is possible. So where is complete knowledge possible? Well, games are like this, chess or checkers, right? You, have, you know everything about the board. You don't need to know anything else. You know the whole world. Uh, many engineering problems are like this. Uh, many business engineering tasks uh, are like this. Whoops, it's going back. Um, how about the big problems, like machine vision, that they couldn't solve? Uh, well, guess, guess what? Uh, if people had trouble recognizing objects, let's say you want to find objects in a shopping basket, and it's very hard for a system to understand from an image what's in the basket or what's on the belt, how do you solve a problem like this? Right? Well, the solution is you uh, put a barcode on everything. And barcode now enables you to actually know what each object is. You can scan it even when it's dark in an angle. You can do it much faster than humans. However, it has nothing to do with how humans see. We don't understand the world because things have barcodes on them. We seem to understand images, right? I can look here and I can see people, I can recognize faces, etc. So we still don't know how humans do it, but we came up with engineering solutions that work at scale in commerce, like, like barcodes uh, for machine vision. So the hype in the 1980s uh, didn't come out to be true, and uh, the predictions also were off. In the 80s, just like now, people were predicting AI will replace many jobs, we will lose our jobs, we won't be working, all that good stuff. It turns out we actually created a lot more jobs, but they were a different type of job. And we took away a lot of the easy stuff to do and, and uh, let humans deal with the harder ones. Today, just like the 80s, you see the same hype, the same scary thing. You know, Elon Musk says the, the AI is very dangerous, and uh, people talk about how we will be jobless and brainless. Uh, in the 80s, they talked about the uh, Japanese fifth-generation systems, and the U.S. was scared of it, and they spent hundreds of billions uh, in fear of what it will do. Today, they talk about China 2030. Uh, my personal opinion is it's, it's going to be just like the Japanese program. It's not going to yield much, because the problems are really hard, and we don't understand many of the issues in them. Now, a bit of good news. Inside AI, there's this thing called machine learning, which is, can I make systems change behavior uh, based on input. And there were some very early successes. One of the earliest ones I really like is by this guy at IBM called Arthur Samuel. And he built a checkers player, you know, checkers. And uh, there he is playing his board. The significance of this is that he wasn't a great checker player. He built this program. The program was just scoring board positions and learning 
which ones are better than which ones. And after playing with Samuel many times, it started winning all the time. Then he had the insight of saying, well, if it wins over me, what if I show it all the championship games? So he started feeding it all the championship games in checkers. And this thing started playing at the championship level in, in, in checkers. And of course, not surprisingly, we have chess players today that can beat the grandmasters, and effectively nobody can beat machines today. Uh, but that, again, they solve the problem in a way that has nothing to do with how humans do it. And this way of solving works very well for things like data analysis, classification, predictive analytics. Same, same framework as in the 50s. Um, the theme here is AI. Machine learning sur survived both AI winters, right? In the first one and the second one. And I think it will survive the third one. We will have another AI winter because people will be uh, disappointed. And we got a lot of uh, good stuff coming out of it uh, to this day. Uh, I really like this quote at the bottom here by my friend Peter Norvig at Google. He basically says, and I think he's right, we don't have better algorithms. Like since the 80s till now, I don't think we have that many better algorithms. But we have a lot more data. And that is what has enabled uh, machine learning to, to work. So there are many practical and useful applications, recommender systems, search. Search engines use machine learning, chatbots. Uh, there's interesting applications like Erika from Mathematica. There are embarrassing ones like Microsoft Tay. Uh, Microsoft Tay was released in 2015. It was a chatbot. And what happened is Microsoft was trying to push the idea of conversational platforms. And a few hackers basically started talking to this chatbot and figured out that if they talk about to it in a certain language, they can make it start using racial slurs and bad words and all of that. So Microsoft had to shut it down in, in a very embarrassing uh, <laughs> um, There's very promising stuff, and there's overhyped stuff. You know, IBM Deep Blue did amazing things with intelligence. IBM Watson got a lot of hype. Now I think it's coming back uh, the right way. And there's very useful stuff. Like I, I'm addicted to using Google Maps, for example. Uh, search technology uses machine learning, and without it, we, we can't have good search engines. Uh, there's a lot of uh, good applications there. Uh, there's also promising stuff like facial recognition. We have some very good solutions there. Alexa, which is the chatbot from Microsoft, it has 40,000 skills. And these skills are crowdsourced. People build skills and publish them on a platform, and then they work. So you can teach Alexa to do something. And that's very promising. Annoying, like ad technology that follows you uh, everywhere you go and shows you the same ads. Uh, I'm afraid to say I contributed to some of that bad stuff. Uh, lots of promise and, and big bets, like automotive, uh, autonomous driving, uh, financial advisory, drug discovery. Uh, of these, I think drug discovery is probably the most promising. Autonomous driving, you know, everybody keeps saying cars will drive themselves. I'll make a prediction here, and you can prove me wrong, I hope, but I think I will be right. We're still very, very far from cars driving by themselves. We're more than 20 or 30 years away even though people are predicting it's only a few years away. Um, we said successful AI is about machine learning and data. And we said we don't have better algorithms, we just have more data. So basically, uh, are you getting all the data you need? Are you managing it correctly? And this is where big data comes in. Are you making it useful? And can you get to it very quickly? Uh, big data is a mix of structured, you know, traditional databases and unstructured, like documents, images, videos, etc. cetera. Um, how did it all start? Why did we call it big data? It started because we needed to count. Uh, we needed to count keywords in documents, and we needed to count them in hundreds of billions of documents. Uh, why? Because how, that's how search works. Search needs the counts of keywords, and then it feeds it into a, a ranking function. Everything is a bag of words with counts. So what was the earliest big data machine? I talked about this yesterday at uh, Sabanja University. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it's this machine. And this machine is uh, pretty old, actually, older than the 50s. Uh, this machine is called, uh, uh, it was built uh, by a gentleman named Herman Hollerith. He was in New York. 
And he entered the competition in 1888. Uh, the US Census uh, needs to count how many people are in the United States every 10 years by law. And they ran a competition, who can count faster? And he built this machine, and on the right side, you see this little cabinet, which has punch cards in it. These are the very first punch cards. Uh, they, were the sign of the, they were the size of a treasury, US Treasury bill, the bonds. Uh, why? Because uh, Herman uh, could get a discount from the Treasury Department where they were trying to get rid of old machines that sorted these uh, bonds. And he used them, and he made these cards, and the census used this machine. So he decided, oh, this, I can create a company here. He was an entrepreneur. He created something called the Tabulating Machine Company. Not very good branding. Uh, then he merged with three other companies, and the four companies became called, also not very good branding, Computing Tabulating Recording Company. Uh, then they hired a marketer, and what was their name? Any guesses? Yes. International Business Machines, much better name. So, point is, people came up with these, with these big data machines a long time ago because they needed to deal with this. And what's funny is, from the two centuries ago till now, it's still all about counting and counting very fast. So, lesson number two, data is a huge enabler of practical AI. So, make sure the data is captured and managed as an asset, not as a liability. Uh, need to keep it well governed, otherwise big data will give you a big mess. And that's a huge problem, and we've had speakers from uh, Cloudera here and other big data companies, and I've spoken on the topic before. Uh, that data can actually capture sorry, social media, documents, customer service recording, audio, video assets, etc. Okay, so we said it's about the data. Now let's take it back to um, cybersecurity. So, Lesson number three is AI and machine learning, they expect data in certain ways. They're very sensitive to how the data is shown. So make sure you can access that data quickly and correctly. Otherwise, you'll spend all your time trying to chase the data. So how does this work in cybersecurity? Well, consider a bank, right, where you collect data about customer interactions. Uh, in the old days, it was very manual, and people just knew. So KYC was know your customer, was very cheap to do. People in the branch knew the customers. You knew who was a good risk, you knew who was a bad risk, etc. When they scaled, they basically lost that knowledge, the intimate knowledge, and suddenly they had to spend lots of money on things like KYC. So know your customer in a typical big bank is 100 to $200 million a year. Risk is about 300 to $400 million a year. So these became very, very expensive because the technology that was very manual sort of went to automation, but involved a lot of people in it. So until today, the banks use a lot of people in their technology. And by the way, the cybercrime in banking is huge. So in financial institutions, on average, it grew by um, uh, from, from 12 or 13 million per firm in 2014 to 18 million per firm in 2017, and it's still growing at the same rate. So it's growing really bad, really fast. I've listed a few uh, recent uh, 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 events here that happened in financial services. Um, a little bit about what we did at Barclays. We actually, uh, this is collaboration started with Trolls Erting uh, when he was running security and I was running data. Basically, we had to use big data in the middle because we wanted to grab data from everywhere, outside the bank, inside the bank, credit cards, trades, systems, logs, all of that, and put it in one place. The interesting thing is when we put it in that one place, and we were very secure about it, everybody in the bank wanted access to it because it was the place that actually made the data available and understandable and easily accessible. So cybersecurity, then compliance, trade monitoring, fraud detection, financial crime, etc. And we don't have time to talk a lot about, about these applications. This architecture we call the data fusion, and that's the ability to basically build a data lake and then manage it properly with the right way to enable people to actually detect events and quickly home in on the right uh, events there. And the thing to say about it here is we were aiming, and I think this is important, at a hybrid solution, meaning um, there's stuff that's easy to classify as bad, there's stuff that's easy to classify as good, and most of the stuff in the middle is the hard stuff. And what we did is we used machines to help humans 
go through the stuff that is not easy to predict either way, and very quickly home in on the ones that they need to pay attention to. And that really leads to my uh, lesson number five, and I'll tell you four at the end. There is no autonomous AI. There is no general AI, right? AI is about hybrid solutions where humans make the tough decisions. Machines do a lot of the low-level stuff that actually humans are not very good at in general. Uh, mostly data collection and data sifting and so forth. So what has changed, right? In e-commerce, why, why is this important beyond banking? In e-commerce, a simple transaction used to be what, when, where, how much, and what payment method. Now it is where are you, what is around you, are you moving, how fast, are you accelerating, are you slowing down, are you parking, what's the temperature, uh, what's the data exhaust around you, uh, and there's graph data. Where is, what is near you, who is near you, where are you going to next, uh, where are you heading to? All of this now is attached to a transaction. So we went from a simple world where it was just a few values to a new world where it's a lot of stuff. And in that world, a lot of things break, right? This is the Internet of Things. This is where, you know, how do these things know? Who do they trust? Who do they report to? Etc. cetera. Uh, probably with that, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to just skip the next few sections. But I just wanted to leave you with, with the notion that this is a whole new frontier where the whole idea of protecting the perimeter uh, no longer works. So I'll give you a couple of case studies in cybersecurity, in, in critical infrastructure, and then wrap up. And these come uh, uh, courtesy of uh, Versec, a company we work with. Uh, lots of news about this. Critical infrastructure is when you attack a power plant a water a purification system, etc. cetera. Uh, and the reason these systems get attacked is, by the way, they are, they, they, they are in a weaker position than normal systems. Why? Control systems have to be up 100% of the time. So it's very hard to take them down to patch them. So they don't get patched enough. Uh, what we call OT and IT are uh, changing. And even air gap architecture, meaning even if you something is not connected to the internet, you can actually hack into it and engineer into it through social engineering and other means. Um, old end of support Windows systems, a lot of these systems are running, yep, time is up, uh, are running and, uh, you know, Windows 98 and Windows XP, and it, it, we don't invest in, in bringing them up, so you can't uh, uh, basically uh, keep them up to date. So with that, I just wanted to mention that the proper way to handle that world is basically to detect at runtime that things go bad, right? So a lot of these algorithms, you cannot detect them by looking for signatures, but you can detect them when the program starts misbehaving. And uh, there's case studies, I'm skipping here, but we'll make the, the, the slides available, of how you could actually detect a lot of the well-known attacks by studying how the memory is, is executing. So probably with that, I'm going to, uh, and this is a company called Versec, which was actually uh, named as number one in the RSA 2018 conference uh, in, in this world. So what I wanted to leave you with here is a couple of thoughts that I'm going to skip here, but just my lessons to remember from, from today, which are the five uh, pragmatic enterprise. Reduce the problem to a very narrow one. Data is a huge enabler, so it's important to capture the right data. It's important to make the data available in the right formats. Uh, so when you do your digital transformation, be aware of that. M build deeper models of the user, right? This is the new opportunity here. So don't just do statistical stuff. Try to understand what the user is trying to do or get grab intent. And finally, there is no autonomous AI, so look for solutions that are hybrid uh, on both sides. Uh, with that, uh, thank you for listening, and my contact info is here, and we'll make the slides available. So thank you.